Alrighty, welcome to Romero Records Virtual Cast. Today we have on Bobby Osinski. How's it going? Uh, so far, so good, Jackson. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. As um, I was just telling you, I listen to your podcast pretty much every day, and I actually don't even remember how I stumbled upon it. Um, I might have just been looking for like a music business or music podcast and and found it, but um, yeah, it's amazing like all the guests you've had on i've found out so much about the music business and and music in general so um i would love for you to just i guess you know how you usually start out your podcast tell people how you got started and uh and we'll go from there okay i was a musician um and i still am but um when I was in high school, I was playing four nights a week in clubs already. So I started really early. This is back in the days when you could do that because there's lots of places to play much more than now. But um, I did that and um, eventually got into the biggest band in my particular area. And we, um, we toured mostly up and down the East Coast uh, got a record deal, and I was shocked to find out that when I got into the big city studio to find out how mediocre I was. <laughs> <laughs> you always think you're better than you are, especially when you're playing clubs, but, uh, you know, in the big city studio, all of the warts are under a microscope. So at that point, and, and I also got very involved in production, and I was lucky enough, the record label allowed me to get my feet involved in recording by letting me record all of the demos for all of their their bands. So I became pretty good recording. But I was unsatisfied with the way the record came out and decided that I was going to be a producer. And the best way for me, at least I thought it was, was to go to Berkeley College of Music. So I went to Berkeley and discovered that that wasn't actually the best way anyway. Um, after a couple semesters, they asked me to be a teacher there, mostly because I had a lot of experience already recording in, in the studio. So I became a teacher and probably it wasn't a good idea. I wasn't ready, but did the best I could. But the thing that happened there was I went into the teacher's lounge one day and there was somebody in there just ranting and raving. And the quote was, uh, oh, this place is for rookies or has-beens. <laughs> and it hit me right between the eyes. It's like, oh, I don't want to be either of those. So I immediately went and gave my res resignation. And as soon as the semester was over, I moved to California, moved to Los Angeles. And I started like everybody starts, I think like everybody starts anyway. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have much money in my pocket. I was sleeping on people's couches and just taking whatever kind of gig I could. So that meant as a player, that meant as an arranger, that meant as an engineer. So I was doing scope commercials and I was doing music for movies and doing engineering for bands, big ones and baby bands and just any kind of gig I could get. And from there, it kind of went on where I, you know, got more and more gigs and I met more and more people and then started to, uh, I was always a player and that was number one in my mind. I wanted to do that and I wanted to produce, but I was getting jobs as an, an engineer as well. The thing about it is, I was a good engineer, but I wasn't a good mixer. Mm. I, I just could not get my arms around mixing. But because I started to write for magazines, I did all these interviews and I met all these people and I met the best mixers on the planet. So I went to them and I asked them what they did and how they did it. And they all told me, lucky for me. And I thought to myself, you know, I bet I'm not the only one that feels like this. So I decided, now by this time I'd written 
hundreds of articles for like 12 different music magazines. And, and how that started was kind of ironic as well, because that was, <laughs> I was, you know, you talk about opportunities that hit you or just situations. I was on a tour bus and the bass player came on and he said, I just got a job writing for the music paper. Music paper was a very big music paper for at, around the New York area at the time. And it's where all the gigs were. I say everything about music, but something hit me and I thought, you know, if he could do that, so can I. Mm -hmm. So next thing I know, I, I put my feelers out to various magazines and mix magazine gave me my first chance at writing. And I just saw that article recently as pretty terrible. <laughs> I, I was mediocre boy, I'll tell you. But uh, they allowed me to keep doing it. And I got other gigs. And next thing I know, I'm writing for like 12 different magazines. But again, it all came down to I, I was st still doing other stuff as well. And I wanted to uh, become a better mixer. And I thought, maybe I should write a book on this. And the thing about it is everybody told me that it can't happen. They all said, it, you know, mixing is so subjective. Mixing is something that you can't teach. I thought, well, I'm going to give it a try. So I wrote the Mixing Engineer's Handbook with the help of all these other engineers that knew much more than I did. And there was no book on mixing at the time. And it became a, like a big hit. And it's still a big seller. It continues to sell every year and continues to sell more. Maybe by the time this is out, I think the fifth edition of it will be out. But that started me on my my second career as a writer. Everybody says the same thing. They write a book and they go, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> because so many brain cells die <laughs> while you're doing it. It's not easy. And I certainly said that. But since the book was doing really well, the publishing came back and said, you got to write a second one. Okay. So I wrote the master, uh, the mixing, the recording engineer's handbook, and then the mastering engineer's handbook, and then the music producer's handbook, and it went on and on. And next thing you know, I have 25 books under my belt. <laughs> Actually, now it's more. I, I think it's 28 or 29. Oh, my done. goodness. They're not all in the music business. Now, I've actually gone outside the music business. I've written one on, on cruising because I like to cruise. And I've written one on, this is a, a ship cruising, just to be clear. And um, I've written one on, two on social media, one for musicians and one for entrepreneurs. A couple other things too. But anyway, uh, you know, it turned into kind of like a second career. And then actually a third career happened right after that. And it was one day I was thinking to myself, you know, if I write another book, I'm really not going to make that much more money. I can write five more books and I kind of hit a ceiling with this. Maybe I should try something else. And that's when I started to do online courses and I met the people at lynda.com and did some from them and for them. And then I decided, well, maybe I can do some on my own. So that became kind of like a third career where now I have online courses as well as the books and as well as doing, you know, all the other stuff. So that's, that's my life in a nutshell. So let's go back to, um, I guess from where you were, uh, doing the engineering and then you started to, to get into different things when you realize, I guess, like when you realize, uh, you weren't good at mixing and um, all the other skills that you could develop. Was that just a, I want to do this because I'm interested or I want to do this to evolve in the music business? Well, I certainly wanted to evolve, but I'll tell you one thing that really kicks you in the pants on this is when you do a, a, a rough mix for somebody and the musicians come back in the next day and they go, that's the worst mix I've ever heard. <laughs> I, you know, someone actually told that to me and they were not wrong. That's the sad part about the whole thing. Oh. But that's what, you know, I decided I, I got to get better at this. I can't keep, you know, doing this and getting those type of responses. So that 
put me on my path to figure it out. And I'm a pretty good mixer now, I have to say, but really because there's so many people that help me, to be honest with you. Jeez, it's just, there are some people that just have the feel for it. They're really good. They don't have, they don't need anybody to tell them how to do it. But most of us are not like that. Most of us kind of need some help. And certainly I was there. I was one of them. Do you feel like you took, I guess, the right, quote unquote, right path to where you are now? Or or do you wish you had did um, maybe like a different order of things, like started out great at mixing and then, you know, producing or, you know, started out as a musician, then mix, you know, what about the order? I don't know that I regret anything, to be honest with you, but there are probably better ways to do it. Uh, one of the things is I was never an assistant for anybody. And I came up during the period of time where there were, especially in Los Angeles, there were loads of commercial studios. I think when I got here, there, there was a, a, a paper that used to come out that would list all of the studios, 24 track studios in the time at the time, which were, you know, big commercial ones. There were 127 in LA. Mm. which is a huge number yeah. certainly not even close to that now but nonetheless i did not take the path of becoming an assistant i was offered many gigs at the big studios a m and capital and whatever i probably could have gotten better faster and had a much bigger career had i done that but i don't regret not doing it because you know you're on the path to you choose so i accept it it's okay yeah, and I actually heard you talk about that in your podcast, and um, I took it upon myself. I, I actually um, started a, a studio in Memphis with one of my good friends, and we actually met doing a podcast together. But um, by the way, I'm in Memphis. Just mm. let you know. But, I, um, lovely place. I love the love it there. Absolutely. And uh, I took that idea because I'm all about collaboration. I feel like people get better. Uh, people get better with competition but people also get better with collaboration. And I was like, that sounds like a great idea. Like everybody should know where everybody is. And also thought it'd be cool to know who has what equipment, because maybe somebody comes in and you're like, Ooh, I really need a certain microphone or a certain uh, compressor or something like that. And I know so-and-so has it. Let me just call them up and see if they will let me borrow it. Yeah. And so I started my own like, studio list and I'm, I'm just going to do it all on my own and I'm going to send it out to the other studios around here. And, um, you know, if they're interested, sure. If they're not, whatever, I'm, I'm still going to give it to them because I think it's something that builds a, a sense of character, uh, in the area. And I think Memphis, I, I've been here since 2019. That's when I moved here. And, um, I, to me, it seems like there's this gap um, I actually talked to Terry Manning. I had a podcast with him. Yeah. And, you know, he was in that, that golden era, I guess I would, would call it, in Memphis. And then I feel like there was this gap. And then there's like, Memphis is really known for like rap music now. Well, of course, all the older people remember it for like the the blues and R&B. But now it's just pretty much like these these top level rappers. And I feel like that that gap kind of hurt them as far as collaboration. So it's something I want to kind of bring back because I feel like there's a huge uh, push of younger people, but they don't have the older people kind of like guiding them to do uh, projects and stuff like that together. So I, I just thought that was a, an amazing tool that you were, you were uh, talking about that LA had back in the day. Well, one of the things, I don't think any of the classic engineers don't want to help. I think most of the time they're not asked. So that's a big part of it. Uh, I remember going into sessions. I went back to where I grew up in Pennsylvania. And there was a brand new studio that opened up and it had an AMEC console. And for a little while when I moved to LA, I had worked for AMEC, the the console manufacturer, the English console manufacturer. And I knew all about this. When I walked in there doing a session, I knew more about the console than they did. I knew more about recording than they did. 
and nobody asked for my advice, so I didn't give it to him. I wasn't going to push it on him, but I could have helped him a lot if if all they would have done is asked. But it's not up to me to to offer that stuff, and you know, I feel uncomfortable actually doing that unless somebody says, "Hey, can you help me out?" Hmm. You know. Yeah, I mean, sometimes people don't feel comfortable asking. Like some people feel like. Um, you know, if you're somebody's boss and they've got better ideas than you, you know, it's kind of might feel awkward asking them for advice when you're the one that should know more. But, um, you know, in, in the situation of music, I think it's, it's already, it should be already understood that somebody's better than you and somebody knows more than you. I don't care who you are there's somebody out there that can do something better than you. So I think it, it really benefits people to just be open-minded and understand like I can reach out to somebody and they're going to make my life better in music, uh, no, no matter what it is. Um, there's, there's just a sense of like, I guess just like a feeling that you can get from just collaborating with people that you've never spoken to before. You know, you start to build a relationship with them. And then and when you start doing music with them, it's like, Oh, I didn't think about that. Like, um, I was in the studio one time with some of my friends, we were making a song and, uh, one of my friends was doing the engineering and the mixing and he's like putting stuff together. And I was waiting for like a certain part of the song for him to do something. And he never did it. And I was like, you know, kind of getting kind of frustrated. And I was like, why is he not doing this thing? And I was like, wait a minute, only I'm thinking this, like, he's not thinking this. I have to actually say something to him. Yeah. <laughs> and verbalize that, it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, that's something as musicians, we, um, we kind of, we want something, but we don't really vocalize it until it might be too late. Well, it depends on your personality. I've been with a lot of people that had no qualms about vocalizing it, believe <laughs> me. So, you know, it can cut both ways, I think. Yeah. Um, so there's a few things I wanted to actually bring up to you. Uh, one, I, I love talking about plugins. I love talking about hardware. And um, also just, of, of course, techniques and things like that. Um, and then also studios, places you've been. Um so one of them, I, w I did want to let you know that I went to, uh, I went to Blackbird and experienced their, um, their Dolby Atmos room. Um, I, I just went there just on a whim, hoping they give me a tour and Rolf was there. He gave me a tour and, um, s there were some guys that were in there setting up the Dolby Atmos room and, you know, Rolf is just taking me around. We go in there and then they were like, oh yeah, this place sounds great. And I was like, can I listen? They're like, yeah, sure. So they finished setting up and they let me listen to it. And I was like, this is fantastic. I don't, <laughs> I don't even have words for this. And then, um, where else did, oh, I, I just went to sun studio, uh, mm -hmm. for the first, you know, it took me forever to get there, but I just went, I actually have a friend there who uh, gives the tours. And after the tour, she was like, come on back. So we went to the control room and she showed me all the equipment and she's like, yeah, half of this stuff barely even works, but, <laughs> but it's all the original stuff from like when Elvis was there. I'm like, this is crazy. Um, so I just, I'm curious on some more stories from you on places that you've been that maybe you were in awe or, uh, you're, you might've had one, uh, thought about a place and it turned out to be different. Well, some of the best places in the planet are here in Los Angeles. And I've been to a lot of them all over the world. And, you know, certainly there are great places everywhere, but Los Angeles just has some, one of the best is uh, A&M, which is now Henson. It's been Henson for a long time, but A&M was one of the best places. It was the Charlie Chaplin original Charlie Chaplin stage and every studio there was four of them at the time there was actually five because there's Herb Alpert's personal studio up on on the second floor but they all sounded really good and the big ones were really special so and, and the 
they tweaked they were one of the few places that tweaked their reverbs so the the plates that they had so the plates really sounded terrific and i was always i, I worked quite a bit there and i was always in awe of it and who, the people that you would meet i can remember now this is dating me but nonetheless uh i was in studio b and i could remember walking out in the hallway and there was um lionel richie that i ran into and i turned around and there was jocko pastorius a famous bass player playing you know sitting in the hall playing and then they used to have a game room and i went to the game room and i was playing pinball and the, the old pinball machines and somebody tapped me on the shoulder says hey can i play i said yeah and the next ball came up so here you take it it was joni mitchell <laughs> so there was that t type of thing that you know you don't have much these days because you know home studios or studios are one-room facilities and back then we had multi-room facilities so there was always th and that's one of the things all of the engineers and producers from and musicians from back then kind of lament that we don't have that today because half the fun was going to a session and seeing who you'd meet that were you know was on the other sessions so that was always a lot of fun but there's such great places here conway is really fantastic capital is you know really great record plant and work there much but um you know <laughs> it was like a who's who so you know i was lucky to kind of grow up in in that one of the best places is way off the radar it's my friend um, richard gibbs that owns it out in malibu and it's a place called um <laughs> skipping my mind right now <laughs> um anyway uh it's it's on um it's overlooking the beach up on the hill and it's unlike any studio you've ever seen there's no walls hmm. but if you want there are movable walls that they they had made in germany that will come out from the sides and we'll give you three spaces. We'll basically give you a control room if you want, plus a piano room, plus a drum room, if you choose to use it. Otherwise, you can get up to a, you know, like a 35 piece orchestra in there. And Richard originally was a uh, film composer. So, you know, we built it for himself, but it's beautiful. It's fantastic. There's um, windows everywhere. You can open up the, the French doors and, and the Malibu wind blows through. So just to show you the clientele he gets, it's uh, like Coldplay, it's uh, Shawn Mendes, it's uh, uh, Barbara Streisand, it's, you know, like a who's who of people that are there. Every time I talk to him, it's, you know, somebody, it was, U2 was there a lot, um, so, but it's, it's a fantastic place and it's off the radar. It's the, called the Woodshed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Are, are there certain places that, you would go to for specific reasons like um say you just really love the reverb chamber of one place or you just really liked uh the drum setup of another place is is that how you would i guess pick and choose uh it all depends on the budget to be honest with you for me i never worked on that many a-list projects i was not in that league but I worked on a lot of B-list projects that had a reasonable budget, but a lot of times what dictated how far the budget would go would be where you would record. So we didn't go to the A-list places because the budget would go in a flash. So you went to the B and C-list places usually. And sometimes, like for instance, I can remember tracking an album at Village Recorders, another great, fantastic room. And then doing uh, all the overdubs at a really small place you know in, in north hollywood and and that's in i think i did the mix at home but you know that's kind of the way a lot of that stuff went for me uh, i just didn't have the let's face it there are few people that actually get to always live on that a level but you know when you're on an a level you can go for however long you want um, a friend as a matter of fact speaking of a&m just going back a friend invited me down one day to a&m and they were they were mixing a u2 album and the 
it was one of their hits. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And the mix was up for 16 days already, and they hadn't fit, they haven't liked anything they wanted. <laughs> so it just goes to to show you that it would just take for and and they have the the budget to just be picky and get what they wanted. And it was funny because I got to be able to go in and listen to all the tracks, you know, just solo things up, not touched anything other than that. And some of them sounded so god awful. <laughs> you know, it's just terrible. But yet you put them in the mix and they work perfectly. It was a you know big learning lesson for me. It's like, well, it doesn't have to sound good on its own. It just has to work. <laughs> um, so I guess a, a heavy question that is uh, similar to that. Um, do you feel like for the state of the music industry that – music has gotten better as far as quality wise, or do you think it's still on par with the way it's always been? How do you feel? And, you know, I guess streaming has a big effect on that with luffs and uh, the different uh, high fidelity rates and stuff like that of, um, let's see, Tidal and Amazon Music. But how do you think, I guess, just music quality has, has changed over time? Well, there's two questions there. If we talk about the quality, the sonic quality, that's one thing. If we talk about the subjective entertainment quality, it's another one. Uh, as far as entertainment, the way I see it is it's no different than it's ever been. Mm, music goes through trends. It goes through peaks and valleys. It goes one way. It goes another way. But the fact of the matter is, hits are difficult to get, and it's catching lightning in the bottle. It doesn't happen a lot for people. And when it does, there's something really special that makes a lot of people react. It's never been easy to get that. It's no easier than it's ever been. It's no harder than it's ever been. So the way I look at the music business is, I, it's different the way music is made today, especially pop music. But had I grown up in the era of today, I'd be making it the same as everybody else. You know, you, you just do what's available to you. You use what's available to you. So, I, you know, I'm not one that looks back nostalgically at recording or at, at music. It just is. It, it was back then. It is today. So, you know, I don't look at it as one being better than another. As far as sonic quality... There was a, a peak in Sonics, and I would say it was probably late 80s, early, I'm sorry, late 70s, early 80s, hmm. where there was a peak in quality. And well, that was the era of um, discrete solid state consoles. And some would say that when we went from tube to solid state, there was a drop off and yes there was but then it got to the point where designers are really good with solid state and then it went from solid state discrete solid state components to integrated circuits and a lot of stuff built around integrated circuits and it went downhill and it sort of never recovered when you buy a high piece of a high quality piece of gear today it's most likely it's discrete electronics and it's not using in too many integrated circuits there's a limitation with them. So sonically, you know, we're not quite as good as we used to be at a lot of that stuff, but there's still everything we need to make it great. So, uh, you know, again, I don't see all that much of a drop off. One of the things that I, I, I am chagrined at is the whole, the whole mythology of tape and like the idolization of it how people well, loved it well they didn't that's the whole thing back then we used it because that's all there was but there wasn't a lot of people that said gee i like the sound of that <laughs> no <laughs> uh, i i mean what happened was I, I i can remember this distinctly so many times being frustrated where man is out there playing and you're listening off the console and you're going, boy, that really sounds good. And it, then you record it, it goes to the tape machine, you play it back, and you go, oh, why does it sound like that? No, it's different. You know, I don't want that. 
So when I hear people being very nostalgic about it, it's not. It's usually people that didn't grow up in that era, era that seem to be nostalgic about it or seem to want that sound. But it's like we we hated it. We we wanted to get away from that. So I listened to a lot of that stuff with oh tape tape saturation. You have to have it. It's like why? <laughs> <laughs> so you know I look at that and I'm kind of chagrined, but I know it's a way of working for people. And if you get great results, then go for it. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the phrase old will become new again. Uh, we will take old techniques of of things and we'll glamorize them, even with clothing. Like, uh, I mean, even this, this sweater is kind of, you know, a little old school. Uh, we, we do things from, you know, the past and try to make it new again. And that that becomes the trend. Um, you were even talking about with, um, gosh, Bruno Mars and Anderson Pack you know you were saying you think funk will make a comeback and, i hope it does <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's it's something that's it's not new but people can make it new you know if you're 18 years old you not you probably aren't used to listening to funk music so it's going to be new to you and it's going to be something trendy but you see you just hit on something jackson whenever they talk about the the generation gap in music what that is is if you rehear something that's let's, let's say you grew up on whatever type of music we'll just say funk and then a period passes and you hear somebody that's imitating that and they come out with it again they're successful and you go wait i've heard that before i heard it like when i was growing up and it's not new to me but there's a whole new generation that never heard it the first time so now they're really into this and this might happen in your lifetime like three times, whereas, you know, something that becomes hot again, you know, yeah, it's not really different to me. I have heard this a lot. And, and therein kind of lies the, the generation gap in all this, where it's like, well, you know, it's not, not, not doing it for me because I'm, it's not new to me. One of my favorite things is finding out about samples. Like I'll hear music. And uh, they'll come out with uh, somebody will make some YouTube video showing everybody like, oh, so and so sampled this this person. And that's that, I love that. I love finding out about things that were sampled because it shows, I guess, the creativity that they, the people used or maybe lack thereof <laughs> because, yeah. they just you know, they just took a sample from something. But um, it's it's interesting finding out how people. Uh, discover, you know, old music and, and try to bring it back to life with, with something new. There's, uh, you know, there's a school of thought that it's like, well, why don't you just create your own stuff <laughs> instead of sampling that? But again, it's, you work with the tools that you have, you work with the taste of the time. So I don't see it as a conflict at all. You, you just, you know, again, if, I would grow up in a certain era. I would use the tools of the era. So, you know, it doesn't, I, I see it very clearly for that. Many people don't. Yeah. All right. So speaking of tools, let's get into analog and digital. So as far as like all the hardware that we have today, um, do you see a big difference in things that are coming out that are kind of new? I don't know if you've had a chance to experience that, um, there's, I think it's UF8, the um, SSL, uh, like mini console that they have. And then also um, SSL, they're killing it. I just realized that. Um, they've got that fusion. It's mm -hmm. like a, a mastering processor. And then um, I guess comparing that to the things that are old, but people still use them, like Poltex, LA2As, uh, the 1176s. I know that Purple has their... Um, their purple MC 77, they've got their, their version of the 1176. Are, have you gotten a chance to, to play with these newer things versus the older things? And, and how do you compare them? Well, you have to understand, first of all, the older like Poltex and 1176s, there were certain settings that everybody used. And the, it's the settings that were kind of special and, and were on completely in the sweet spot of 
which an analog device has, and you don't necessarily have that with digital, where you just have to get the levels just right for it to sing. So that has a lot to do with it. If you're not aware of what those settings are, then, you know, there's not much difference between them, but you will hear a difference. Well, if you have a lot of experience with the old one, you'll notice something that's newer. It might not be the same. Is it better? Is it worse? It's, in some ways, it's better. In some ways, it's worse. It's not as noisy. Some of the, you know, the newer stuff, the clones, are certainly not as noisy. But as we found, sometimes the noise is what contributes to making it sound really interesting. Um, I have no qualms about the new stuff at all. And as a matter of fact, I believe that the overall quality, just looking at the audio recording spectrum of what's available, I believe that everything sounds better sonically than it ever has. The overall level has come up of everything. So it's really hard to buy something that sounds bad. Once upon a time, that was not the case. You know, if you'd pay $100 for something, it would sound like $100 as compared to something that was $1,000 or $10,000. And now there might not be as wide a gap between what you get for 100 and what you get for 1000 it depends on what you buy, obviously, but, you know, it, everything in general just sounds better because we know how to do it better because, you know, everything's built around, like I was saying before, the solid state electronics are built around uh, integrated circuits. Those have gotten way better, uh, especially on interfaces. Interfaces now are built around analog digital analog and digital converters, analog to digital converters, digital to analog converters that, again, are built around a chip, and the chips are so much better than they ever were. So something that you pay, you know, a couple hundred dollars for today sounds better than you, what you paid a couple thousand dollars for, you know, maybe 10 years ago. So I would say in general that the Sonics are, are better, but that doesn't mean that everybody uses them. I, I'm another thing I'm chagrined with is this persistence on using 44.1 kilohertz to record at in 16 bit. And I, I just, you know, slap my head every time. Why? There's no reason to do 44.1. It, it should just be banned. <laughs> honestly, it, it, it doesn't do you any good. 48k should be the least amount. Now, why? Because 48K is a broadcast and film standard, first of all. Mm. So anything that's going to, it even has a chance of going there, has to be transcoded. You might as well just do it a 48K, 24-bit, because that's the standard. So it's certainly going to sound better. I haven't recorded anything less than 96K in 20 years. Mm. Uh, I don't see any reason to. And I've done the test, Jackson where we'd have three different rigs, one at 48K, one at 96K, and one at, at uh, 192, and recording the same thing. I've done those tests, and I can tell you that 192 blows everything away, and it's substantially different, substantially hmm. better. Nin the difference between 96K and 48K is there, but when you hear 96 to 172, you go, wow, that's so much more real why we didn't change to that mostly because of horsepower in the early days using 192 it meant that you needed twice as much horsepower of course at least twice as much storage space not a big deal today but you can many plugins wouldn't work at 192 now they do many plugins also were um you get half the power you get half as many much of that is overcome these days, so it's not a problem, but we still don't go there. Classical and jazz do all the time, but not so much, you know, anybody else. I, you know, as a matter of fact, when you do something for a major label, there's, you get a delivery spec, which you never used to get, but there's a, a delivery spec, and the delivery spec on most of them says you they want 96K files. 
And I think that that's something that a lot of people, when you like, I've, I've been in Facebook groups on, um, for UAD, like I, I use the Apollo X four. That's what I use to record all the time. And, uh, that for, for at home at the studio, we have, uh, we've got an X 16 and, um, we, we usually record at 48. The reason why is because a, a lot of the people who record at our studio are using uh, like DistroKid or United Masters to distribute their music. And United Masters, do, do you know about them with Steven Stout? Sure. sure. Um, they, I think there's a 16-bit 44. That's, that's what the, the requirement is to, to send it in. Yes, but that's CD. But so what? Yeah, and it's you just transcode it after you finish. It'll still sound better. <laughs> I think that the people who um, who are you know doing the music, they I don't think they even know. And I'm just like, there's a big difference between <laughs> between these. And you know, maybe your average listener, they usually don't know either. But I think you know, just using the tool, as you said, you know, use the tools that you have. We have these great universal audio Apollos and um, all these other interfaces that Avid's got the carbon. You know, they can go up to these higher bit rates and create great sounding things. But I think sometimes, you know, other other things get limit us. But hey, let's let's just use what we got. Here's the, the other thing. It's like a 32 bit float. So why use 32 bit float? Well, if you're doing something live, it's really important because there, for instance, on a lot of, of recorders that are just 32-bit float, there's no gain on them because you don't need it. The reason why is if it looks like it's clipped, all you have to do is bring it down and the clip goes away because of a 32-bit float. Now, it doesn't do you any good in mixing to you know go up to 32, it, but it does during recording because we all know how, that, how crazy that could be. You know, you do sound check and or, or any kind of check and and it's one way and every, musicians get going and it's a different way so uh, you know there's a good reason for doing that but the knowledge isn't out there about all this stuff unfortunately it's not far enough out there yeah i mean i actually just saw the i i'm subscribed to production expert and they mm, just yeah. put out that um article about, yeah, yeah yeah right yeah i think it's there uh maybe it's like a zoom or something like that. It was a uh, a portable audio recorder. And there's a zoom and there's a sound sound design one. Yeah, and they were just talking about how it now uh, utilizes 32 bit float. Yeah, and you know some people might be like, okay, so what? And then other people are like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Some people know how to use their tools differently. Well, the pros get it. You know, especially if you're a location recording or you do a lot of live stuff you know then then you get it you're you're trying anything to get around distortion and that gives you the best chance but you got to yeah. know about it and you have to understand how it works so when it comes to plugins what are some things that make you really excited and then what are some things you're like scratching your head and why do we have this well i told you the ones that make me scratch my head are the saturation plugins not saturation so much it's the tape saturation ones that kind of bug me because yeah. that's what we wanted to get away from but uh i can certainly understand the need for saturation and it's useful many times i don't find it useful to use oh first thing i'm going to put saturation on i kind of use it i believe it should be used as well as not necessarily a last resort, but it's something like, you know, I tried everything else and it won't work. Let's see what happens here. And nine times out of 10, that will help you out. But uh, you know, want to exhaust some of the other methods first. So, you know, that's one of the things. But the things I that really excite me, I would say there are two. The first one is the reverbs suddenly are way, way better than they've ever been. Mm. They're much more realistic, even the less expensive ones. One by Relab, the uh, LX480 uh, is really fantastic for what it is, really cheap too. And um, it's fantastic. But there are some wonderful reverbs that really don't take a lot of processing. For a lot of time, a lot of the, the time in you know plug-in history, 
the really good sounding reverbs took up a lot of processing power, so you couldn't use a lot of them. But now we're getting to the point where they're much more efficient. The other thing that I really like are the new artificial intelligence based processors that use AI to make your life easier. Mm. Now, there's two schools of thought on it. One is, uh, you know, the Soothe is, is one, and Isotope has a bunch of, you know, things that they do. Yeah. It's just off the top of my head. But there are two schools of thought. The one school of thought is, well, that's cheating. So a lot <laughs> of the classic engineers will go, well, you know, just learn how to do it right, and you don't have to use any of that stuff. The way I look at it is anything that can make my life easier and faster, I love because the less time I spend on the mix, the better for everybody. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, any help like that, I welcome. And if it can make it sound better on top of it, yeah, I open my arms to it. Yeah, to me, I've never, I've never understood the, the thought of that's cheating because you have to think there are songwriters out there who write lyrics but don't sing them and then they sell it to an artist and then the artist sings it and makes millions off a hit you can call that cheating if you want to but that's that's feeding that person's family <laughs> you know that's that's how they put food on the table is just by singing a song that somebody else wrote and you know the the hip hop industry will destroy somebody's career when they find out and like, Oh, they didn't write their lyrics. They did that to Drake, um, a while back. They were like, Oh, Drake didn't write his lyrics again. So what I, I, to me, I think people are just upset that he did half the work, but gets all the credit. <laughs> like to me, that's, that seems like just jealousy at that point. Cause you're like this guy, Drake, you know, he used to act, he was in Degrassi and you know, the the guy knows how to entertain people. And that's just his form of entertainment is just taking somebody else's work. And even if it's with sample, he's he's been the king of like um, rapping or singing over sampled beats and making hits. And who cares how he got how he got the beat or how he got the lyrics? I'm going to still crank it up and listen to it. <laughs> Yeah, like I was saying, it's not easy to get hits. You capture lightning in the bottle, and if you can do it more than once, boy, you're really good. So I can never begrudge anyone for for having a hit, having something that a lot of people really love, no matter how they got it, because it's not easy. Yeah, and so speaking of that, I know you have your Hit Makers Club. Um, so with something like that, uh, you've you've got like a community behind it, do you feel like that has, how do you feel like that's helped people uh, understand and get a grasp of how the industry works, how to make hits and how to just uh, not, not so much force trying to make music be, uh, I guess, uh, compliant to, to today's standards. A lot of the stuff that I teach online, a lot of my courses are based around mixing. There's some around the music business, uh, Hitmakers Club is different because it's based around production, music production. So every week there's something different. One week it's a song and mix critique. So you send me in your songs and mixes and I'll give you an honest opinion. As brutal as it may be sometimes. The next week I do something called What Makes a Song a Hit, where I'll take whatever is the biggest hit on the global charts at the moment and break it down and discover why is this a hit as much as we can. So we'll go and we'll look at everything about it, the song form, the mixing, the mastering, the production, uh, listen to all the tiny little things that are going on, pointing out just little bits and pieces that many people never quite hear. The third week is a Q&A with me. And then the fourth week, we have something called an advice lounge. Advice Lounge is a Zoom conference where everybody can get on and you get to share, you get to talk about your opportunities, your problems, and you get advice from me, but you get advice from the group as well. And it's a lot of fun and we all learn something. So that's the basic part. I also do something called Deconstructed Hits, which I'll take something from the past, 
So, for instance, recently I heard All Along the Watchtower by Jimi Hendrix. Uh, I was in a restaurant. I heard it and I thought, well, that'd be a good one. So I'll break it down and go through everything. Uh, I've done it. another one that I just heard is Lionel Richie all night long. And, you know, go through that. And it's useful many times. Well, the good thing about that is many times I'm able to find the, the tracks online, which, you know, are just isolated tracks. And we'll be able to hear them very precisely what's going on. So that's what Hitmakers Club is all about. There's also a Facebook group. And it's a, an exclusive closed group. And uh, again, it's great for advice. It's great for sharing. So th that's what that's all about. It's more production oriented than some of my other things, but that's what people need. The, now, when it comes to song critiques, and I do a lot of these, one of the things I always find is people may be good at doing a lot of things. They may be good at recording or mixing, and they may be really good at, at writing a song, but the production falls down often because they don't listen enough to what's happening. They don't listen enough to what happens in a hit. So what happens is you get the bare bones of a song without all the little color items that are going on, all the extra harmonies, you know, the vocals and the, the, the sounds and everything that, that's going on, which really makes any song hit, doesn't matter what it is. That, you know, if, if you're not aware of it, it goes right by you but really important. And that's the biggest thing that is not in, uh, in, in the song. Many of the songs I get, people just don't, they're not aware. So my job is to make them aware of it. Are there some things that you feel like people of your generation um, might have cherished and loved that people now just kind of throw it by the wayside and then vice versa, people who are younger are like oh this is this is the greatest thing and your generation's like ah eh, that's that's not so great well i think you can look at the any genre of music first of all and it's funny because you listen to the you know pop music today and it's easy to dismiss it could be easy to dismiss it but you know back when i started we had pop music too that was no different it was no different in the fact that it might have been lightweight lyrically you know, but again, every hit, no matter what it is, there's something to it that it's usually well produced. It's usually well performed. It's rare that you get something that doesn't have those two qualities. Mm. So, uh, you know, there's really no difference in between except maybe your attitude. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that the people, I guess, young people now, they they have like this collective thought of what what is good and what isn't and it's uh it's like group think i think you know if if something is hot like oh man so i've been doing music videos for artists I, you know i've been the camera I, I do way too much stuff but um i had a guy come to me and he showed me a music video and it didn't look great and he was like can you do that he was like i, I want you to do that for me he was like it doesn't look like it doesn't look like top quality and people love that can you do that? And I was like, are, is he listening to himself? Yeah, 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 but why? Yeah, right. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> that, that blows my mind that, you know, he's, he's realizing that people don't like good quality videos. So that's what he wants. Jackson, I had the same thing happen to me in quite a uh, It must have been the early 90s, maybe, when the big deal for a little while was to get a vocal and make it as distorted as possible. And it was so against what I had learned, I, it was so difficult for me to do. I did everything I could not to do this. And then it dawned on me, well, that's what people want. That's what they're paying me for. Let me make it as distorted as they want it. It's but like, yes, that's a, I mean, it's no <laughs> different, really. It's the same thing. It might may go beyond your, your, your artistic senses, but it's not your money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so my, my friend Ryan, he does uproar recording. That's, you know, we do it out of the studio. He'll, um, he'll be recording with people and they'll ask him, you know, Hey, can, why, why don't, why don't I sound like this? Can you do this? And they're like comparing themselves to top level artists. And I'm just like, you can't do that. Like you aren't that person. And I, I think like a lot of times I have to describe to people that 
um, making music is a lot like cooking. You know, if some if you give somebody ground beef, don't expect them to come out with a, a perfect ribeye or a cowboy steak. Like it's it's not a thing. You have to first of all let's start with the recording. If the recording's not great. You're not going to get the best quality out of it. So these are things that I think beginners. You know, I don't think the professionals really have to deal with that as much. I I, I did hear like a. Um, Billy Decker, he was talking about how um, people will still send him bad recordings and they expect him to just make it immaculate. And it's like, ah, that's not <laughs> that's not a thing. Uh, you know, that whole thing is pretty funny in that people don't realize the average musician, the average, ar average artist, the average songwriter does not understand what it takes to make a really good recording. And what the average really great hit great sounding hit what it's gone through because many think that okay i'll just go in the studio i'll lay it down and we're done <laughs> but they don't realize that the vocal might have been done five times six times eight times where and on different days where the artist will do it and will go that's eh, not quite right and come back a month later and do it again and all the parts they'll just do and redo and redo and keep on doing it until they get exactly what they want and it will that's why you know it takes months to do because you know you just at a certain point you, you can't settle for anything less your artistic sensibilities won't allow you to do that now there's a certain point that you can overwork things there's no doubt about that on the other hand i've found that if you have any inkling inside of you that says that could be better then you should do it again mm. because if you don't you're never going to be happy and you're always going to have in the back of your mind you know i really settled on something and i shouldn't have yeah i, I do that all the time and it took me a while to even to even have that thought in my head of if this could be better just do it yeah. you know, if i've got a home studio i have no excuse to not just go in there and record again because it would be different if I was paying, you know, Sun Studio charges like two hundred dollars an hour. That'd be different. But I'm I'm at home. Just do it again. Um, is is there something that you feel like could improve um, very quickly in in the music industry as far as maybe? Um, well, I, I think equipment. We're kind of. Well, I guess I can't see it. You know, now just because it's so great. Now maybe somebody you know, twenty years ago would be like, oh. I had no idea we'd have Apollo interfaces and stuff like that. But yeah. uh, is, is there anything that you feel like maybe microphones or, you know, stuff like Townsend, they've got the emulations and Slate Digital. Uh, do you feel like there's something equipment wise or software wise that uh, is coming up that just might blow our minds? The biggest thing uh, is speaker technology, because that hasn't changed in more than 100 years. It's evolved, it's gotten better, but it's the same thing. It's, you know, paper cones that are moving the air for the most part. It's, there's been many tries at different technologies to replace that. None have been successful. I've recently talked to a group of audio scientists who were really smart. I mean, th these were some of the people that, for instance, I talked to the guy who is responsible for the codec the codec hmm. the the whole idea of the codec right and they were intimating to me that there was something new coming up that was going to change everything but they wouldn't tell me what it was oh. the only thing they would say is well, when we get it we'll let you know now i always thought that the best way for us to have immersive audio, and I agree with you that at most, and you know, immersive audio in general is really fantastic, but I don't see the average person really getting into it because it costs a lot. It doesn't have to, but you know, it costs more than just a couple of speakers. And not only that, there's a placement issue, less than it used to be, but it's still there. If in fact there was a way that you can paint your walls with speakers, or the speakers would automatically be, or the walls would automatically be transducers. That you didn't have to worry about that. It was just built in. That would change everything in terms of how we listen to audio and what, how it's immersive. Now, by the way, 
I mentioned this to these audio scientists, and they smiled at one another and, you know, just said, well, wait, you'll, you'll hear something. <laughs> so I, I don't know how close or far away that is, but. Mm. Yeah, that's that sounds interesting. And yeah. stuff like that got thrown around when um, so Slate, Slate Digital will always throw out these um, these hints at what they're coming up with. And so recently, I think the most recent technology that came out was the headphones um, that emulate different rooms. And, you know, of course, they've got their commercials for it where they've got uh, top level engineers are like, this is this is the best, you know, I've <laughs> Sure, if it is or not, whatever. But uh, a lot of people are hoping that they were going to come out with speakers that could emulate other speakers. And I don't think that's realistic just because the room, like, you know, the speakers are your monitors, whatever you have. If you had these slate digital monitors, you couldn't really hear what you can hear at Capitol just because your room isn't capital. So I don't don't think that'd be effective, but the headphone thing made sense because everything's just in between your head. Right. So that's the sound like that. So I think that's as close as we're going to get as far as that type of stuff, but with speakers and stuff like that, I think, as you were saying, the walls, that's, that's going to be the game changer. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, really, you know, speaker technology, when you think about it, it hasn't been, there hasn't been anything new, really new, really innovative in, you know, 120 years. Yes, there's electro- electrostatic speakers, you could say. That, they were big for half a minute. They don't work in pro audio because they don't take the power level that we need. You know, there's a, a lot of those things that have their their downsides that, you know, we haven't, there's a reason why we haven't adopted them. But maybe soon, we'll see. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> you know, it, it, headphones have come a long way, I have to say, from the standpoint that five years ago, I would tell everybody, don't rely on headphones for a good mix. That's all different now because the headphones are better, but that's a small part of it. It's the fact that we have room emulation software that's so good. Between Sonarworks, between Abbey Road Studio 3, between, you know, there, there's a ton of them now. The Slate that really do a good job of representing a, a room maybe a better job than than your real speakers can do so it's well worthwhile to get something like that and to use it at least as a secondary monitoring source yeah currently i'm using uh the yamaha hs8s in my home studio and then um these headphones are the the neumanns the nd20s and I, I really love these they have like a um i guess accuracy about them some people say that they're very dark and they're not accurate but to me it they really help me um get a better mix just because um like i when with these there's no car test like i usually finish this go out listen to it in the car and if it's good out there then i'm good but with these it's like this this is my car test Hmm. and it's it's been crazy like once i finish i'm like okay now now i'm done with the yamahas let me listen to it with the Neumanns and if it's good here and there I'm good Jackson I'm gonna have to split in a bit so um yeah yeah, yeah you know. we're, we're good uh this has been been an hour um go ahead and give everybody uh how they can reach you and 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 everything and uh all your courses and socials well the easiest thing is bobbyosinski.com and you can get the blogs and podcasts and the courses and everything through that bunch of freebies there as well so there's a lot that you can get just from the website as far as uh social you know i'm on instagram i'm on facebook let's see TikTok pretty soon i haven't done much but i'm going to be doing more and uh let's see what else youtube i have a youtube channel it's not all that active but they're are some really good things on there so it you know it's worth taking a look at as well so that's how to get me best thing is just go to the website awesome thank you so much for doing this um you've definitely been one of the people that i've i was like man i i've made it once i've <laughs> oh, well. that's that's the top so again thank you so much and uh i always look forward to to listen to your podcast when they come out thanks jackson it's a pleasure good to talk to you good to meet you 
Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.